Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. I think it's safe to say that um, all of us here are looking forward to heaven one day. I think there are very few, even in the world, who you know, may not profess Christianity, who would say, no, I, I don't want to go to a place of eternal reward when this life is over. Everybody wants to believe that, that life doesn't end when this life is over, and that there is a better place waiting for us. And I want us to take a few moments uh, this morning to think about the idea that you cannot get to heaven alone. Now, some might look at that title and think that this is going to be a lesson on evangelism and that we have to take folks with us to heaven. And certainly that's true. We need to try to bring people with us to heaven. That's the job of a Christian. But that's not the aim or the focus of this lesson. This is also going to be a two-parter. We will begin it this week and conclude uh, next Sunday morning, tonight being our Q&A uh, sermon this evening. As we begin to think about this, number one, we need to realize that some try to get to heaven by goodness alone. There's where we get the alone from. Some try to get to heaven by goodness alone. Most people seem to believe that one only has to be good in order to make it to heaven. And of course, you know, depending on the person... Uh, that definition of what good is might vary. You know, different people have different definitions of what good is, but many believe that as long as one tries to do what they believe is right, that God is going to allow them into heaven simply because of their goodness, because they've, they've tried to do what they believe was right at all times. I would suggest that while being good is essential to going to heaven, it won't get you to heaven all by itself. Being, goodness is, being good is important, but it's not enough by itself to get us to heaven. Jesus, first of all, teaches us that in, in the truest sense, there's really only one who's good, and, and that is God. Remember in Matthew 19 and verse 17, when the uh, rich young ruler had approached Jesus and called him uh, you know, the good master, the good teacher, and Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good uh, but one, and that is God. Truly, there is only one who really is good, and that is God, the Godhead that has not sinned. No matter how good we may be, you see, we still are guilty of sin. Romans uh, 3 and verse 23 tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So where there is sin... There has to be atonement. There has to be some kind of sacrifice, a blood sacrifice for sin. And goodness alone does not offer that atonement. There, you will not find any passage in the scriptures that suggests that you, by being good and trying to do what is right, apart from obedience to the will of God, is going to get you into heaven or give you for forgiveness of your sins. Two biblical examples that I want us to consider to prove this point. The first one being the young man that I've already mentioned, the rich young ruler. If you look in um, Matthew 19, verses 16 to 22, we read, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I've kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, 
for he had great possessions. Now as we consider this young man, we know that he's a, a young man from the other accounts, the other gospel accounts. He's young, he's also described as a ruler and he's rich, a rich young ruler we call him. Uh, he probably was a ruler in the sense of being a member of the Sanhedrin, but uh, as a result of that, notice that this man was a good man in many ways. First of all, we see that he comes to Jesus and, you know, he, he, he bestows honor upon Jesus. He calls him a good teacher. He acknowledges the authority of Jesus and coming to him and asking him, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? He didn't go to the Pharisees or the Sadducees. He came to Jesus and asked the question. So he has a lot going for him. And Jesus tells him, keep the commandments. And then he lists several of them there. And we know that when he's done with that initial list, he says, I've done all these things from my youth, all my life, Lord, I, I've done these things. He hadn't murdered. He hadn't stolen. He hadn't committed adultery. You know, by, by nearly anyone's definition, we would if we were classifying this man, put him in the category of good. Remember last week we talked about how sometimes we categorize good, bad, and, and no opinion, so to speak. We would classify this man as a moral person who, who has a lot of good qualities. We would put him over in that good category. However, in spite of all that goodness, in spite of this man doing what he thought was right, he still was lacking in his quest. To have salvation, to have eternal life. You see, his goodness alone wasn't enough to get him to heaven. What was this man lacking? Well, he was covetous. He loved his riches more than he loved God. And covetousness is idolatry, Colossians 3 and verse 5. And so he was an idolater. In what sense? Well, his riches were his God. But all of his goodness that he had done, all of those commands that he had keeping, that by itself alone was not going to get him into heaven. He had to give up his idol, his riches, and, and the passage tells us that he was unwilling to do that. Another example is one we know well from the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, we have a description of a man named Cornelius. In Acts 10, 1 and 2, it says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people, and prayed to God always. Boy, if, if we thought the rich young ruler was a good man, Cornelius even more so. Listen to the way that man is described. He's a man who feared God with all his household. A devout man. So he feared God, he was devout, and his household as well. So he was a teacher, he... He was, according to the law of Moses, doing what Moses had commanded in that, you know, teaching their children the, the ways of God. So they were believers as well. We're told in regard to him that um, he gave alms generously to the people. So he was uh, a man who was generous, a man who considered the poor. He wasn't selfish with his, his goods and his riches. And he prays to God always. And so there is a dependence there upon God and a, sub, a submission to the will of God and that he's praying to God always. And yet I'm here to tell you that all of those good qualities did not get that, would not have been enough to get that man to heaven. How do you know that, preacher? Well, look over in Acts chapter 11. This is actually... Later, when Peter is giving an account to the Jews of what had taken place, we know Peter is sent to Cornelius to teach him the truth. And Peter here says that uh, Cornelius it says told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Now notice, who will tell you words by which you and your household will be saved. You catch that? Will be is a future tense. That means that when Cornelius had that vision, when he saw that angel who told him to send for Peter, he was not saved. He was not heaven bound at that point in his life because his goodness alone wasn't enough to give him the remission of sins. He needed to be taught. He needed to receive the gospel so that he could obey the gospel, so that his sins might be washed away. His goodness alone wasn't enough. But again, 
by the worldly standards, a guy who prays, a guy who donates to charity, a guy who has his household all in order, everyone believes in God, we'd categorize him as a good person. He is a good person, but he's not good enough to get to heaven alone. His goodness won't get him there alone. It takes obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So some try to get to heaven on their goodness alone. Number two, some try to get to heaven on God's love alone. Some try to get to heaven on God's love alone. What do I mean by that? Well, we know 1 John 4, verses 8 and 9, that God is love. John writes, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. For God is love. There at the end of verse 8. And so the reasoning goes among some individuals that a loving God would never send anyone to eternal punishment. How could a loving God ever do something like that? I would suggest to you that God's love is essential to our salvation. But it's not going to get you to heaven by itself alone. God's love is needed. We can't get to heaven without God's love. But by itself, it's not enough. Think about it using this line of reasoning that, well, I'm going to make it to heaven because God is love and God would never send someone to eternal punishment, so he's going to allow me into heaven. Using that line of reasoning, wouldn't we have to conclude that everyone was going to be saved? That nobody would be lost? Because obviously God's love extends to all mankind. It extends to all the world. John 3.16 God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so... This would mean that the love of God would then force him to reward rapists, murderers, drug dealers, other sinners who have not repented and obeyed his will with heaven. Now again, I'm not saying that it's impossible for a murderer or a rapist to go to heaven, but we know that they have to repent and they have to obey the gospel to do that. But if the love of God alone is enough, then does God love a murderer? Yeah, he does. He doesn't love their actions, but you bet he loves their soul. We would have to conclude that that murderer could go to heaven having committed murder. Hitler could go to heaven. Uh, you know, fill in the blank with uh, whatever type of sin or sinner you can think of. We would have to conclude that God has allowed that person into heaven. So then the, what happens as a result of that belief? is we have the love of God negating the righteousness and justice of God. And so what, we were, what we're saying is, is we can't have a loving God who is also just and righteous. And, and that's not right, because God is described as both righteous and just. The Bible makes it clear that, you know, not everyone is going to be saved. Jesus taught very clearly on that in Matthew uh, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. He talked about the narrow gate and the broad way. And he talks about there are a few who find that narrow gate that leads to eternal life. But the one that leads to destruction, that broad way, he says there are many who go into that. So Jesus tells us there are going to be individuals when this life ends who are lost. The love of God is not going to be sufficient to save us by itself. There's something we have to do. I would suggest to you God's love doesn't negate his justice, but rather his love is regulated by his justice. Okay, he loves all, but that's not going to do away with his righteous nature or his just nature. He still has to be just and he still has to be righteous. And we understand as parents that even though we love our children, that sometimes punishment is necessary. And even though it gives us no joy, we understand that it is necessary. And God, is, God is, is far above us in terms of being a parent. All sin that is not forgiven, I lost my place. All sin that is not forgiven will have to be punished. Because God is just and God is holy. In Romans 2, verses 5 through 9, we read, But in accordance with your hardness, 
Paul is talking to his Jewish brethren right now. In your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But though, to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what's waiting? Indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jews first, and also of the Greek. As we said, God does love all, and God is love, and it gives God no pleasure to have to punish. But Paul here tells us very plainly that those who do not obey the gospel, that those who are self-seeking, who, and those who obey unrighteousness, that indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish is what is coming down the road for those. And so, Yes, God loves everyone. But he's not going to save everyone because he's also just and righteous. He's only going to save the obedient to his will. And we, we read in Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 about Jesus. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having, become, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all and then those three extra words, it's not, it doesn't end there, to all who obey Him. You see, the love of God, is it necessary? Absolutely. We need it. We need His grace and His mercy and His love. But it's not enough. God will only save those who obey Him, those who do His will. So, goodness alone won't get me to heaven. God's love alone won't get me to heaven. And then finally, number three, good works alone isn't going to get me to heaven. Good works alone. This is closely related to goodness. Um, but the idea of good works. There are those who look at salvation as sort of being, a, a, if you will, a balancing act of good and bad. Think of scales, you know. And they, the way they, they see it is that, you know, when everything is said and done, and they stand before God at the judgment. As long as the good outweighs the bad, they're going to be all right. You know, as long as they've done more good than they've done bad, they're going to be all right. You see, these people don't, don't profess to be perfect. They know that they sin and there's sin in their life. And, and they know that, you know, um, God is the ultimate judge. But in their mind, the standard of judgment is going to be Good works. Have I done enough good? And if I've done enough good in, the, in service to God, then, then He'll allow me into heaven. So they rely on their good works. So that what they've done is they've really sort of fallen into the trap of believing that, you know, if I do enough good works, God's going to owe me. He's going to owe me. And when I go to the judgment, He's going to look at all the good that I've done and say, boy, you've earned it. You've earned heaven. Come on in. Enter in. And the, Jesus tells us that many are going to try to get into heaven in that way. In Matthew chapter 7, as he's drawing his Sermon on the Mount to a close, in talking about the judgment there in verse 22, he says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? So he says there's going to be people on that day who are going to claim, God, look at all the good I've done. And even in your name, in your service, look at all the good that I've done. Putting that together with Matthew 25 there, you know, their good works. Maybe they, they fed the hungry. Maybe they clothed the naked. Maybe they cared for the sick. Maybe they visited those who were in prison. Maybe they had attended religious services. Maybe they read their Bible even on a daily basis. Maybe they cared for orphans and widows and others who needed their help. There are a lot of good works that can and are being done by people who are not Christians. But in Matthew 7, in this account, Jesus never argues that they didn't have good works. He didn't, he didn't argue with them and say, no, you didn't do those things. Yet as we read on there in Matthew 7 and verse 23, 
we see that Jesus tells them, in, in essence, your good works aren't going to save you. He says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus wasn't condemning their good works. What he was telling them that was that their good works weren't going to get them into heaven. Their good works alone were not going to get them into heaven. Um, they had done good in the name of Jesus, but they were disobedient. They weren't obedient in all things. They weren't faithful Christians. The good that we do is good. It's important. And a Christian, you know, who a person who is a Christian needs to have good works. We're told to have good works. But those good works aren't what gets us to heaven. They're not what gets us to heaven. We're not getting to heaven by the works of righteousness that we have done. Titus 3 and verse 5. We read, not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's. It's God's mercy and God's grace that saves us. We could never do enough good works to wash away one sin. Because that's not how it works. It takes the blood of Christ to wash away sins. Only humble submission to the will of God will save us. And we go back again to Matthew 7 and verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will. Of my Father in heaven. What was wrong with those people in Matthew 7? They hadn't done the will of the Father. They had done some good works. Yeah, great. But they weren't fully obedient. They hadn't done the will of the Father. They hadn't humbly submitted to the will of God. Now, I want to say this. It's important. There's a difference in submitting to the will of God and fulfilling the requirements of salvation. And as compared to simply trying to work our way into salvation. To work our way into heaven on our own terms. You see, there are people who say, well, okay, fine. Uh, you, you're saying no works are required, but then you tell people they have to do something. What do we tell you have to do? You have to hear, believe, repent, confess, and, and be baptized. And they'll say, you see, you're, you're telling them they have to be baptized. That's a work. We're not saved by works. And I, my argument is baptism, number one, it isn't a work. Baptism is a humble act of submission to the will of God. It says, John said this morning, the answer of a good conscience toward God. God said, do it. I'm going to do it. I don't think God owes me salvation because of that. But I can rest assured and have assurance that I'm going to receive it because he promised it if I do that. And there's a difference. You see, we're not saying God owes us anything when we obey the gospel. We're saying, thanks be to God that I'm going to receive the gift that he's offered because I've met the terms that he has set forth. You know, the Jews of, of Paul's day, they were guilty of trying to work their own way into heaven. Paul described them in Romans 10, 3. He says in regard to them, they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Our world is full of individuals like that today who seek to establish their own righteousness without submitting to the righteousness of God. I'm just going to do good. I'm going to be a good person. And God's going to owe me salvation because God is love. And he's going to see that I'm a good person and all the good works that I've done. But yet they've never submitted to the righteousness of God. They've never obeyed the gospel. And the scriptures make it clear. That without a humble obedience to the gospel of Christ. We have no hope. So when a believer obeys the gospel. He is not. If he's been taught correctly. He is not viewing his obedience as earning his salvation. Rather, he views his obedience as a humble and appreciative acceptance of the gift of salvation that God has offered. Let me conclude by saying good works are essential to our walk in the light. We have to have good works. But we need to understand that those good works by themselves are not going to do it. It's not enough. I could never do enough good works to get me into heaven. 
Ephesians 2 and verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Do Christians need to have good works? Yes. Do good works make you a Christian? No. Good works are what we do once we become a Christian. So that we can glorify God and bring glory to his name. Friend, if you're here this morning having never obeyed the gospel, maybe you fall into one of these categories. Maybe, maybe you've thought all your life, you know, as long as I'm a good person, as long as I do good, that the loving God of heaven, he would never condemn me to eternal punishment. Please understand that God does not want to condemn you to eternal punishment, but he has set a plan in place. And he tells us that only those who obey him, only those who humbly submit to his will, will have salvation. Friend, if you've not done that, we offer you the opportunity to do that. If you're a good person, if you do good works, that's great. That means there's less that you have to change in your life. But know that the good works, being good, does not wash away sins. It's the blood of Jesus that washes away sins. And we come into contact with that blood when we obey the gospel. When we hear the word. When we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. When we repent or turn from our sins. Confessing our faith in Him. And being baptized. Wherein, Acts 22.16, our sins are washed away. Friend, if you've not done that, we offer you that opportunity this morning. If you have, but you've ceased to walk in the light. Maybe you no longer have the good works. Maybe you're no longer living as you should. Please understand that you need to get back in a right relationship with God. And even though you've obeyed the gospel, that doesn't guarantee your salvation if you become unfaithful. You need to repent of the sin in your life and ask God's forgiveness and He'll give it. And we would be glad to help you. If there's anyone who needs to respond to the invitation, we encourage you to come as we stand and as we sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.